Hi, I'm Bob Harrington from Duke University. I'm here at the ACC meetings in New Orleans, and I have the opportunity to talk with two colleagues this afternoon about some recent clinical trials finding. In this case, a comparison of access approach using the femoral approach against the radial approach. Uh, in the largest trial yet done to this to this date, uh, asking this question. So let's dive right into it. I have Dave Kenzari uh, from Atlanta, Laura Maury from Boston. Both of you experienced interventionalists. Both of you have told me off camera you do about 50% radial, 50% femoral, so you're great people to think about this trial, great people to ask the question. David, first describe the rival trial. In fact, uh, Bob, you might say that Laura and I might have been ideal rival investigators because the investigators in this trial had to perform a minimum number of transradial procedures and on average performed about 40% transradial at their respective institutions. But this was, as you say, against the background of studies suggesting with a transradial approach reductions in bleeding and vascular complications. Uh, in many ways, a, a, a long-standing called for trial of 7,000 patients randomized at five, on five continents, 156 sites, 32 countries, to a one-to-one -one radial versus femoral access strategy. Uh, the study was evaluating a 30-day primary endpoint of death, myocardial infarction, stroke, and major bleeding as well. David, why was this trial so important? You've alluded to some of it. The, the previous evidence was single center observation, some larger uh, multi-center observational studies, some smaller randomized trials. Why was this trial so important? I think in many ways it's just as you say, we have a, a, a large background of observational studies uh, indirectly comparing transradial versus transfemoral approach. There are small randomized trials, meta-analyses of such, but altogether we had no definitive study that suggested that a transradial approach could conclusively improve the safety outcomes. And then by reducing outcomes such as bleeding, perhaps that could translate into reductions in ischemic adverse events and perhaps mortality itself. So, Laura, it was a trial that was powered for the, uh, for the ischemic endpoints. As David said, a lot of the previous work had really focused on the vascular access complications and certainly had plenty of power for the vascular access complications. What did they find? So it's interesting. You know, the primary endpoint, as David mentioned, was the composite of the ischemic outcomes of death and my stroke um, together with the outcome of bleeding. And what they found was that there wasn't a significant difference. And when you actually look at the way um, that they defined um, the bleeding outcome, although there was a significant difference on access site complications, access site related bleeding, um, there was no significant difference on bleeding alone. Um, and this was primarily uh, probably related to the patient population that they studied. Um, this is a patient population who were being treated for either acute coronary syndromes or ST elevation MI. And um, the, the majority of the bleeding events were actually not related to the access site. So as you would predict, the radial approach was associated with lower risk of access site complications. So I think that that confirms our expectations for radials. The fact that it didn't translate to a reduction in ischemic events, uh, probably also not a surprise, um, given that I, we, although we might have some observational literature that would suggest a benefit, um, we really had no randomized trial data to support that. And this confirms um, that, that basically the main benefit is going to be on preventing access site complications. Now, overall, there were fairly low complication rates in this group of patients. I mean, these were good operators. Yeah. Um, these were good operators, both for radial and for femoral, and so that made it a high bar um, for radial to, to beat. Uh, for sure. But perhaps some of the news being that if you're good at femoral, you don't necessarily have to abandon it for radial, mm -hmm. and vice versa. If you enjoy doing the radial procedure, you don't have to give that up and go back to the femoral approach. In many ways, it says we should get comfortable doing both and use them in situations where perhaps it fits the patient. The one thing that I thought was really impressive was the patient preference. Um, when patients were queried what, which approach they preferred, 90% uh, would be happy to have the radial procedure again, and the, the rate was much lower for, for femoral. Um, and so I think it is a good option for patients, um, and there are, there are certainly you know, implications to patient comfort by selecting this approach. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. The patient-reported outcomes, we mm -hmm. do have that data here, yeah, and they great. showed us that. David, there were a couple of other interesting findings, at least I thought were interesting. There was the finding in the ST elevation MI population, and then there was the finding amongst high-volume operators, high-volume sites. Want to tell us about that? 
Yeah, you know, just as a, uh, just to echo the comments too about how well the interventionalists perform the transfemoral approach too. Remember that this is against the background of a low utilization of direct uh, thrombin inhibitors too in the trial. One of the uh, other findings, as you mentioned, is in the SD elevation MI cohort that actually had a more an which represented about a quarter to a third of the study population. With transradial approach, there was an observed reduction in mortality. Now, the mechanisms of what drove mortality are not yet elucidated from, I think, an analysis of the data, and we'll await that. But um, in addition to that, there was a suggestion that outcomes would be improved. The composite outcome might be improved with uh, a higher volume uh, or, or more experienced operators. On the one hand, some might say initially to discount the uh, the, the trial by saying, well, it was the low volume operators and, you know, that drove the, the, or mitigated the difference with a transfemoral approach. But actually that's not the case because interestingly this was not a, a tiered uh, outcome with low to intermediate to high level operators, but rather the, the, the highest rate of adverse events in the transradial cohort were observed in the intermediate group. Just with regard to one other substudy too, there was a cost effectiveness analysis from this too. And I think here once again, Maybe in less intuitively, uh, or, or we would have thought, we would have thought the transradial might be associated with some benefit, and um, maybe the ACS population is not the population though to to study this. These are patients who are for other issues going to require longer hospital durations. So I still think we need to revisit this in a more elective setting. It, you know, on the topic of the cost-benefit analysis, it's you know it's important to note that this. This patient population had a very low utilization of femoral closure devices, um, and it you know, is predominantly driven by the practices in the countries where the study was done. In the U.S., you know, as you know, the, the diffusion of, of closure devices is much greater, and it may be that that cost-benefit between not just femoral versus radial, but femoral closure device versus radial access tends more to favor the radial. Which has been suggested in smaller comparative trials versus transradial. Mm -hmm. Laura, the, the, the ST elevation MI piece really intrigued me because uh, even amongst experienced American radialists, if you will, many of them go the femoral approach in ST elevation MI. So I was intrigued by that. Do you, do you think that obviously we'll need to get more data to understand this better? But what did you think about that? Well, I, I think it's very exciting. I mean, I think that um, ST elevation MI is a setting where uh, patients are acutely ill, so we're, we're concerned about doing the pr procedure in a timely fashion. Um, on the other hand, these are patients who may be heavily anticoagulated, um, and uh, we need to do the procedure quickly. Um, and so it's uh, it's a setting where there you know there are great risks and, and trade offs. Um, what um, you know what. I think is fascinating is that it may be that the benefit to the radial approach is greater in the, in the populations that have more intensive pharmacologic strategies. Where the benefit of reducing bleeding might be amplified. Right, exactly. And, you know, what we see in our practice is that we, our, our lab is shifting. I would say our lab is, is um, really trying to do the majority of cases by radial now, and many of our STEMIs are being done by radial. But it is a learning curve, and this is what the operators observed in the trial. Um, which is that um, as, as we become more familiar, we're more likely to be able to do cases that need to be done quickly. Um, it speaks to the, uh, that the issue is really a team approach to when you consider a transradial. It involves the cath lab setting up the patient, um, getting ready, especially in the throes of an acute myocardial infarction and treating the patient. So it, it, is, um, it is a bit challenging that that was the one area where in some ways we would expect the greatest relative benefit with more aggressive anticoagulation, antithrombotic therapy, but on the other, that represents one of the more challenging uh, subgroups for us to treat yeah, so, I mean, I think as we're adopting. For the, for, as the take home message for the folks that are just learning how to do radial is that STEMI is probably not the best place to start, but once you get sufficient experience and the lab has sufficient experience with prepping patients quickly, it's, it's an it's a it's area a that would be great and benefit. It might be, and it might be better right. for the patient. Both of you are involved with training fellows. How should we be training fellows now? Does this, does this inform that practice, <coughs> David? Yeah, to begin with, I think we need to consider ourselves interventionalists and move away from the more divisive uh, groups of a, trans, of a radialist versus a femoralist. And to do that, um, as we do that, I should say, the opportunity to train the fellows is there. It's uh, noteworthy that there are no programmatic uh, uh, guidelines for the training of fellows for a radial approach. 
It's not um, been included in the competency statements or the training statements, exactly. has Exactly. And, uh, and, and as an aside, too, I think it's, uh, it, it's relevant that the learning curve has never been less steep for doing this through networking, best practice sharing, through educational programs. Simulators, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Laura, you agree with all of that? Yeah, I completely agree that we need to train fellows. And train them in both techniques yeah, so that when techniques. he so or she go out there, they have that. Yeah. Because the, the procedure of doing a radial procedure, you can't just apply all the same principles of femoral. You need, they need to understand device selection um, and the, the particular challenges that they might face. And as I think about, you know, in our own laboratory, a lot of both right and left heart cats together, as the two of you are doing your radial procedures, are you using the upper extremity to do the right heart cats at the same time? Yeah, we are. We are. It's a it's, it's, it's really nice procedure because you can simply have the nurse place an antecubital IV um, in the recovery room, and then we simply do the right heart cath. So you've already there. got access. Yeah, they do the hard part for us. Yep. David, I, doing the same thing? Yeah, I agree with you. So this was a, a nice finding here in, uh, in New Orleans. This is the kind of thing we hope will have some positive impact on practice. Because in the States, it's still the minority of procedures are done by the transradial approach. Mm -hmm. So hopefully these data will stimulate people to uh, perhaps learn how to do the technique and adopt it more widely. Well, thanks both of you for joining, and thank you for listening today.